Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on how circular is your business. We are really thrilled to be hosting this event and are excited to see so many people from across the globe registering and joining us for the conversations today. It's really a testament to see a, grow, a growing global focus on not only sustainability, the circular economy, and how we measure it. Let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Mark De Witt, uh, and I lead the work we do with businesses at Circle Economy. At Circle Economy, we empower for more than 10 years governments and businesses with insights and tools needed to put the circular economy into practice. And today I have the pleasure of moderating the discussion. So as more companies shift from linear to circular models, it is essential not only to implement sustainable practices, but also to measure their effectiveness. And that will be the topic of today. We'll explore key metrics, tools, strategies that can help you and your business to assess performance, but also to enhance resource efficiency and stay ahead in this evolving landscape. And as we were just discussing uh, with the panelists and uh, the contributors here today, we want this to be a session both for the ones that have already made steps towards the circular economy, but expect also those that are quite new to the topic to be tuning in today. So with that said, um, let's dive into this vital topic that is shaping the future of businesses. But before we do, uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, this webinar will last for 60 minutes. Um, the slides that we'll show you will be made available to you afterwards. Um, and I now see that I'm on camera as well, which I think is a great uh, addition to a webinar like this. So we, we encourage you really to ask questions in the Q&A section below, um, and your insights and queries will be really valuable, and we look forward to engaging with you in that matter. So let's make the most of this opportunity together. Uh, but before we dive into the panel discussion and we go into the exchange and invite you to ask the questions, we'd like to take a moment to set the stage for today's topic. So the understanding of the current trends and key issues surrounding the circular economy is essential as we explore this area. And to help us with this overview, I'm pleased to introduce you to Jakko Verstraat Jochemsen, who will provide valuable insights into the landscape of circular economy metrics and reporting. So Jakko Verstraat is director at Circle Economy Consulting, and he has over 10 years of experience and has been instrumental in developing various metrics and reporting standards for the circular economy, helping businesses quantify and re report on their sustainability progress. And today he'll share insights on the best practices and key challenges in the circular economy reporting field. So we're excited to hear from him. Uh, Jaco, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, excited to be here. Um... I hope my camera works. I think it does. So uh, here we go. So uh, as Mark says, the last uh, the last years, there's been quite an uptake on circle economy, circle economy strategy, circle economy standards. And I'm just here to walk you quickly through because there's a lot of abbreviations, three letter, letter acronyms, a lot of different standards out there. Um, and I just wanted to set the scene before we dive into a panel discussion. So. I think here I've tried to list some of the the major standards and frameworks out there right now that can be used in circular economy reporting. Um, um, I post them in a chronological order. 
um, and starting with the circularity gap metric, which was uh, one of the first attempts to really start measuring circular economy. It was our, um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be a bit um, modest here, but it was our own invention at Silk Economy um, back in 2017 when we started measuring how big, how circular the economy was. It's really developed for just awareness creation and putting the topic on the political agenda. Uh, so that does mean that it's it's less accustomed to um, to businesses. And that's where that's the gap that the World Business Council of Sustainable Development stepped in when they started to develop the circular transition indicators a few years later. Um, uh, it's a very notable framework because it was developed with really big industry players, members of the World Business Council. So it immediately had a lot of uptake among a serious business. Um, but it really is a self-assessment framework. It's not so much a reporting guiding uh, uh, framework. It's really a self-assessment framework to help you to identify opportunities and to start measuring your own progress. Um, that's when GRI also stepped in. They, of course, have a different focus. Most of you will know the GRI, which is a really big sustainability reporting framework, really with a focus on reporting, public reporting. And um, back in 2001, I believe, it had the first uh, attempt of including circular economy in their sustainability reporting with two standards, 301, which is more about the material inflows of the company, and GRI 306, which is more about the outflow. What was nice about the GRI is it was the first standard that also asked you to report on qualitative matters. So do you have a strategy? How far are you in implementing that strategy? Um, which the both the, the gap metric and the CTI framework didn't have. So it, it included some uh, qualitative KPIs that added to the, the narrative. And a very recent addition in May this year was that of uh, a new series of ISO standards, which have been in the making for years. Um, a whole series, as you can see, from ISO 5, uh, uh, 95004 to 95040, um, handling different elements from metrics, business models, definitions, you name it. Um, Quite comprehensive. The the problem though is it's it's a bit of a standalone. It didn't really connect to what the CTI, the Get Metric, or the GRI did, and it was also developed in parallel to the the new directive from the European Union, the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the next acronym in our list, um, which also make the, makes that it doesn't connect very clearly to the CRD. But as uh, it's an ISO standard, it's very important to, to uh, nonetheless, especially as I have some very broad consensus on definitions in there that can be very useful. Um, those are the existing standards. Now there's also some frameworks and standards upcoming. So this is not all. And on the next slide, you can see that there's two sets of, of standards and legislation coming. First one is already very well known uh, amongst the many of you, which is the, the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that I mentioned. And very close to that is the EU taxonomy um, developed by the EU, uh, European Commission. Um, this is very noteworthy because this is the first time globally that businesses will be um, uh, will have to mandatory will have to report on circular economy performance, um, and it's also putting quite a high bar up. So it's not just um, a, a simple, simple step. It, it is quite a thorough reporting that's required by these businesses. Um, what I was happy to see is that uh, this the standard uh, that uh, the circular economy standard that's part of the CSRD actually took a lot of their inspiration from the existing standards, the CTI and uh, the GRI most, most of all. Um, not so much of the ISO standard as I said, because they were developed in parallel, unfortunately, but definitely the CTI and the, the GRI are very connected to how the CSRD requires you to report on circular economy. And the newest kit on the block, which will come probably in 2026, is the Global Circularity Protocol from the UN and the World Business Council it's a, a new framework. It has um, it, it's from the same people that um, uh, developed the greenhouse gas protocol, um, and it does add some new elements to the mix. For instance, it will be the first protocol that also will discuss how to set targets um, on circular economy rather than just report on circular economy. Uh, but the main effort is also definitely to harmonize, so not to to add to the complexity, but to see if this can be a way to harmonize all these different standards out there and frameworks out there, kind of see if we can get to one set of definitions and one set of standardized KPIs. So um, 
keep that an eye on that one because that could be very influential in a couple of years. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, this is not um, no, this is not a a, a a a it's a very new thing for businesses. Uh, we did some research last year together with our partners of World Benchmarking Alliance, looking at some of the the uh, major European companies and how they are currently reporting on on sustainability. We looked at over 400 businesses in Europe, and well, first of all, we were quite happy to see that about 77 percent of these businesses, so with a, quite a big majority of them, is already thinking about circular economy, is already mentioning circular economy or circular economy aspects. Sometimes not just circular economy, but more talking about recycling or renewability of their inflows, uh, but the, the circular economy topics are in there. It's not a, a completely new topic to them. Um, most of them actually still kept it to qualitative narrative. So it says, this is what we're doing. This is where we're, we're advancing to. Only 22% 20, 20, of the total of those 400 companies really also added some quantitative information, which is, of course, also required by the, the CSRD and where the CTI focus. So not a lot of them, uh, less than a quarter of them, are already going into quantitative aspects. Um, problem is, and that's, a, of course, partly due to the fact that the, all these standards and frameworks are relatively new, is um, none of these reports really adhere to what the CSRD will be asking from them in the coming years. So even those companies that are reporting some quantitative indicators will still have a lot of work to do to make sure those the, the, the KPIs and the targets that they said are in line with what the CSRD and the CPI are asking from them. Um, so you see that there's a big gap for companies, uh, whereas most of them will be already aware on things like climate change, pollution, things like that. Uh, so economy is a very new kid on the block for a lot of businesses. Um, that doesn't mean though that they can take their time, unfortunately, or, or sit back and take that uh, take a few years. Because if you look at the next slide, you'll see it's not just a topic uh, that you um, um, can, can park for now. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, they can park. This is a, a recent study that shows how important topics under the CSRD, so the, the, the new legislation from the EU, how important they are to businesses. They don't have to report on all topics, but only the topics that are of influence to the, of uh, where they have an influence or has an influence on them. Uh, what you see, though, amongst the, the 45 companies that they these researchers looked into, that over 70% of them, so over 75% even, um, did view circular economy as a what they call a material topic to them, so a topic that they should include in reporting. Uh, and by that, it becomes mandatory to report upon within Europe. And that's about the highest score in the list. Uh, climate change and workforce topics are mandatory for everyone, so that's why it's 100%. Uh, but at least under the environmental standards, the, the topic of circular economy is then the next, next thing that uh, is... Uh, of most importance. So it does show that of those 50,000 businesses in Europe, about 75% of them, so uh, close to 40,000, will have to report on the circular economy performance. So still a very a big amount. Um, as I said, there, a lot of them are struggling. If you can go to the next page, we did a bit of research into that ourselves. Uh, we have a, a self-assessment survey on our website, free for everybody to use, to check how ready they are to report on their the, European CSRD, um, and it, it already shows with the 144 businesses that have used that survey that there's some blockages, some obstacles that a lot of them are experiencing. I've just listed the three here. Um, first of all, it's a lot of new terminology, a lot of new methodologies. The example that is on the top graph here is the LEAP framework, which is um, a, a recommended framework in the under the CSRD. Um, Actually, most people didn't know the framework yet. Um, of those that did know it, most didn't use it, and only about 11% used it, and only half of them actually used it for circular economy purposes. So that shows only 5% of businesses have been using it for circular economy reporting. So that, And that's not just a LEAP framework. That also goes with definitions in there and other, uh, other methodologies like material flow analysis. 
Um, unfortunately, there's also not yet a huge amount of tools out there. Most companies are still using spreadsheets to manage their data and to report on their data, uh, which is not the accountant's favorite, let's put it that way. Um, some have already spent some time on developing their own tool or integrate something in ARP. That's about a third of the companies. Um, and then you see some companies that are actually using dedicated tools like the CTI tool or Circulytics. Unfortunately, Circulytics is um, is stopped. It's not from the Ellen McCartan Foundation. It's not longer there. So that leaves the CTI tool as the only real dedicated circ economy tool free of use out there. Um, so it already shows that it's it's that part is not fully developed yet as well. And then lastly, I already showed quite a few frameworks out there. Um, these are um, also not always familiar to everybody. Uh, about half of the respondents didn't use one of those major standards uh, or used no standard at all. And then from those that actually did use a standard, it's quite a right variety. Some used the GRI, some used uh, science-based targets, some used CTI. It's quite a mix, uh, and that shows the need for harmonization that the Global Circularity Protocol is trying to aim for. Um, so that shows that this is is definitely a topic that's coming. It's on the agenda. It's, a lot of businesses are diving into or will have to dive into it coming year, um, but there are some challenges ahead as well, and this is, I think, why it's a good setting for today's webinar, uh, talking to some people that have are already doing it, have already done it a couple of times, just to see how um, we uh, can also help you kind of mitigate some of that, those obstacles. Um, I think that was it for my setting scene, Mark. So back to you. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Jaco, for um, that bird's eye view and uh, very insightful. I think also very dense in terms of contact uh, and cont content. Um, so again, reiterating that we will share the recording and also these, uh, these materials uh, shown. Um, but with that, let us turn and welcome our panelists today, uh, with whom we would like to delve deeper into the key discussion topic of today. And that's also to derive tips and tricks for you as a business to be efficient and impactful in, in this reporting. Um, so we'll be exploring uh, best practices, uh, real world experiences, but also try to uncover the strategies we have to intend, uh, enhance reporting processes. Um, so let me introduce the two uh, panelists to you. So starting with uh, Jana Streif. Uh, so I'm really pleased to introduce you as panelists today, Jana. Uh, you're from OMV, a company that combines traditional energy operations, but with a very strong and increasing focus on circular economy, on innovation, um, and positioning yourself really as one of the key players in the global energy transition. So Jana joined OMV's group sustainability department in uh, February, 2024. So quite fresh to the job. So uh, we would like to hear that perspective where uh, she focuses on sustainability reporting and raising awareness across all levels of the company on these topics. She also leads efforts to meet the ESRS E5 requirements uh, with a key focus on the circular economy. Um, and when she's not driving sustainability initiatives, you'll likely find her cycling or in her vegetable garden, which I think is a, a great addition. So welcome, uh, Jana, to the panel today. Um, our next panelist is uh, Diverje Ewalds, uh, circularity lead at Deloitte. She is uh, dedicated to driving sustainability initiatives and delivering impactful results with extensive experience in strategy um, at Deloitte and hands-on roles also at the ocean cleanup, so more from the startup uh, environment. Divertje excels in stakeholder management and team leadership, and her expertise covers very relevant topics for today, like general strategy, but also ESG compliance uh, and organizational improvement making her really one of the key players in advancing circularity and sustainability on the global scale. So welcome Divertje and also welcome Jaco as the third uh, panelist today. Uh, really great to have you on this panel. And let me again also reiterate to you as an audience um, to actively participate. So please feel free um, in the chat to ask questions 
uh, throughout the discussion, uh, share insights or inquiries uh, that you have, because that will make the conversation even more um, engaging. So with that, we have three topics that we want to touch on. We'll quickly touch on where to start, which I think is a very relevant element to, to address. Then we'll go into how to develop your strategy and we'll close on how to set specific KPIs and targets. So in that order, but where to start? And I want to uh, turn to you, uh, Jana. So OMV, and actually, as we just learned also yourself, you started earlier this year um, in this role and OMV began its journey to align circular economy initiatives with the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And for companies currently navigating a similar path and people um, in the audience today, could you share where OMV started and, and how the process has been so far? What are your learnings? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really, really happy to talk about my experiences here. Um, as we already said, please feel free to um, ask your questions anytime. I'm really happy to answer anything as we go. Um, but uh, specifically, what I wanted to do is um, maybe discuss a couple of points, very in general, how we approach this topic, how we started engaging in this topic as a company, and then maybe move a bit into more detail of also the, the tools that the, the CSRD and the ESRS provide, such as the double materiality analysis and how we worked on that. Um, I wanted to add maybe that um, while it's true that I'm very new in my current role, um, I had a bit more experience in circular economy previously before joining OMB because it was already in the group and I worked at a subsidiary in the sustainability and public affairs um, department. Um, and the subsidiary is Borealis. It is a chemicals and materials company that already had a rather big footprint in circular economy in general. So when I moved to the group, um, OMV, it, I sort of took this topic with me, um, but also obviously applying it to a wider industry, wider activities that the company had. And um, OMV in general is really um, stepping up its work in the circular economy. It is something that is a, a really key key pillar in the in the business strategy 2030. So yeah, it it made sense, and we we took it as a um, yeah. A good opportunity to to have the ESRS um, have a standard that discusses circular economy for the first time in in, in sort of like setting a standard, um, forcing companies to take a look in the mirror to see where they actually stand in a in a in a topic and then to work on this. So really, the the idea is that it's not just a reporting exercise, but it is really sort of the the stepping stone to take the results of this first reporting cycle and take it further and improve and bring more circular economy actions into the company. Um, and this is maybe one thing that I wanted to, to highlight in the start is that I mentioned that as OMV Group and specifically in a subsidiary, there was already a, a circular economy culture. There was already a focus on circular products, um, which was on the one hand really good because we had something to build upon. We had expertise already but it also sort of um, set the understanding of what is the circular economy. So we went um, into engaging with a topic um, with a preconceived notion of what is and what isn't circular economy. And I think looking back, it would have been better had we had um, a bit more of an open mind and also include different topics, different activities, different models um, that are all part of a circular economy um, that sort of like link together to make it a working system. Um, so my first recommendation really would be to engage with what is out there, the concepts of the circular economy, see what are the different parts of it and be open minded in how you apply it to your company. And this includes also from the start, um, engaging a wider um, sort of like level of expertise and colleagues that are, for example, not um, working specifically on the on the circular economy, but still could, you know, um, open a new perspective on things. So this is really, um, yeah, one thing that we would do differently from now. Great. Thanks for sharing those learnings. Any of the other panelists wants to react or build on these uh, these insights? Well, I, I think what Jan is saying is 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 very interesting. I think um, that that engagement with stakeholders internally, it's it's of course time consuming, especially if there's already different 
uh, concepts of circular economy or different perspectives of circular economy going around. But at the same time, I feel it's also an opportunity. I was talking to another business this morning where we're doing some work and, and he was saying, well, a year ago, I, I, I really needed to go towards people. I needed to ask for some airtime with my, my, my board members just to tell them about the economy. Now I'm starting to get requests. I'm, I'm summoned to meetings because they want answers. So suddenly the, the topic is on the agenda. And of course that takes time to build that common view amongst your internal stakeholders. And it's very much needed uh, to even start um, talking about what are your risks and opportunities? Where should we report? What should be our targets? Um, but I, I think you should also see it as as a very valuable part of the process and where and a part of the process that you only get to do once, right? After that, you're only correct. But now you can set a stage. You have an imperative to 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 do this. Um, and I think this is also just opening doors to people that are working on the topic. I I like that remark uh, a lot, Jaco. Um, actually, it it connects at a different perspective to a question we just uh, received here for which is for you, Jana. Um, and that's actually looking from internal to to external. So the question uh, from the audience is: Can the concept of circularity truly be practiced at an individual business level without without having a dedicated ecosystem available? Um, to cater to this concept. So so what do you do with your supply chain with others outside of the company? Yeah, this is a super valid point. And it is also one that we had to learn and had to engage with and, and have an understanding. Um, I think part of our group is already rather, um, how can I say, really good in, in you know, leveraging value chain opportunities and engaging and creating knowledge and bringing people on board um, to um, really, yeah, incorporate circular, circular economy practices or best, best practices into their work, into their business, into their products. This is something specific because OMV and, and Borealis, the subsidiary, is um, a raw material producer. So um, there is also sort of like, um, yeah, and a role to engage with a value chain that it is important of what people are making out of the raw material and that really circular economy concepts um, or things like eco design should really be thought of uh, at every step of a product that you make from the raw material to the intermediary product to the final product and then you know taking it further even to the end of life management of that product for example so really all stages in the circular economy should be thought about um, it is something that was a bit difficult because I think this value chain engagement is something new. So there was a bit of a, a level that people in the beginning, especially once they weren't so yet so familiar with co uh, circular economy concepts, had to gain an understanding, okay, what is a value chain? How do we define that? Who are the players? What are the steps in the value chain? Mm -hmm. So it is sort of like really a, a digging in and, and tracing, like what are the parts? And it's in a way, if you've never done that, and if you've never thought of that in such a perspective, it is also a bit overwhelming because where do you start? Um, <laughs> and how far, how far back do you go in the value chain or, you know, how far back do you go into when it comes to your product? Where do you start? Where do you end? And what can you, you know, really do as a company that does this for the first time and is still learning itself and everyone else in the value chain is learning. So um, I really hear you. Um, and, but it's also, absolutely definite that this is a major part of what we're doing is um yeah engaging with the value chain and helping each other realizing what the topic is about what we can do to make it better uh work out what you know someone's waste is someone else's product and how you can how you can find these circles in the value chain and i think the more we talk about and the more there is spaces and engagements if it's in customer meetings or if it's in conferences i don't know i think it's really important to just gain an understanding of what are the materials, what are the, the topics we should discuss, and then we can yeah. move on and do better. If, oh, if you, I can so respond much. to that, uh, yeah, please. Mark. Please. I think if you see a shift from a linear to a more circular economy, I think actually within the value chain, your partnerships are more likely to become strategic, where you in a linear economy often have a lot of different players you can suppliers you can choose from if you want to change things together you need to uh, together take that uh, take that risk invest in uh, potentially new business models or new ways of working and it requires i think more strategic partnerships with uh, building on trust 
and uh, doing new things together than um, in, in a linear economy. Um, I think the same thing you see in certain decarbonization uh, journeys as well, especially if you are, need to invest in new plants or in uh, really setting up a new infrastructure, reverse logistics, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Jana, uh, someone else's waste, maybe um, your, your feedstock, uh, this requires changing a set industry. So you cannot, uh, you yeah. cannot do that alone and, and working together on a more strategic level, I think is going to be important there. Let me tag on to, to that thought, uh, Divergy, and, and, and thanks for making that remark. Um, another question just came in from the audience, which I think is interesting here. And that is, and, and I think also for a company like OMV, strongly rooted, let's say, in, in also a, a petrochem petrochemical uh, history, kind of how do you connect the agendas of circular economy with decarbonization? Can, can this provide a solution? And how do you deal with that in the context of these frameworks? Um, it is at least part of it. Um, and this is also a, a major push factor that if you have um, circular feedstocks, for example, for products, um, there is the opportunity to reduce the scope three emissions, um, for example. Um, this is currently the, the bigger connect we have, but obviously we also try to, to implement um, the circular economy in, in, in other parts of the business to, to really leverage all the concepts and, and models that the circular economy offers to, um, yeah, overall improve um, business activities. Yeah, yeah. I think this topic also says a lot about the maturity of the company and, and its ESG strategy, because traditionally a lot of people would see uh, circular economy and, and, and a greenhouse gas strategy um, as separate strategies. Something One is about materials, the other is about emissions, There's, and, and they would have different people working on it, different strategies um, and, and different parts of the the, business, the corporate agenda. Um, I think what you see once companies start to mature more, uh, and especially those where uh, both topics are, for instance, very much focused on the same product, you see that companies start to integrate it and they, they start to see circular economy as a means to further their greenhouse gas strategy. And I think that's where circular economy fits the best as a means, as a, a method to, to transform your business, your value chain, to achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also biodiversity impacts and you name it. It's a means to a sustainability end. Um, and that is tricky because we like to decompose problems into smaller problems and then make people responsible for that and kind of handle issues that, but I think especially in topics like this, if you integrate that into one strategy, uh, you're probably going to have a win-win very soon because it is very connected and the one helps the other. I actually yeah. think that the CGR 23 clearly shows the uh, opportunities if you go to a circular economy and the benefit it can have on various environmental topics. So um, I think you're being a bit modest here, Jaco, not mentioning uh, the great work of Circle. Great for pointing that out, uh, uh, Jim. Um and, and we'll definitely, we can share even in the chat that resource for uh, the audience who is uh, interested. Um, I would like to, um, to thank you, Jana, for kind of kicking us off in terms of where to start, but I would like to move on to the next topic, which is, well, if you then have, have started in whatever shape and form, how do you develop a strategy? And I would like to, to kick that topic off with a question uh, to you, Divertje. Um, because compared to uh, more broad kind of ESG topics, circular economy solutions are very diverse, kind of ranging from waste management to enhanced product design and new supply chains. We, we just touched on it, um, transitioning products into services, um, also that kind of the change of business models. So how can businesses effectively set the right strategy to implement these circular economy solutions? Thanks for uh, thanks for the question. And actually, uh, looking at the strategy and how to help companies is also really what, uh, yeah, gives me the most energy. Um, and this is a combination of looking both at the short term and long term opportunities and risks. So, um, and also very important to connect it to your corporate strategy. So don't see circular economy strategy as a separate one next to your uh, corporate strategy. Um, look ahead at the long term thinking, okay, where is it that we are going with our company? Where 
uh, are our products coming from? What is generating uh, the most revenue? And connecting that to also where uh, are my material flows coming from? So understanding really the current state assessment in terms of uh, material flow, waste streams, uh, and then connecting it in your portfolio to different uh, circular economy strategies. I think you mentioned a couple, um, uh, repairing, uh, reusing, uh, as a service models, um, uh, looking at your waste, if it could be byproducts for other companies, there's a plethora of different solutions out there. And I think for me, it's important to not just look at one different type of uh, solution as um, I think known within a lot of people within the circular community, the, the R ladder, which stands for um, um, all of the solutions starting with an R within circularity, starting from reuse, uh, actually, sorry, from refuse and rethink. So really rethink how can you change the current product that you have to be more circular, uh, to reuse, repair, and finally recycle. Um, there are different strategies, uh, different solutions for all of the products in, in a portfolio. Um, there's not going to be one clear cut. Um, and when you're looking at the different solutions per, per product that you have, or even turning a product into a service or really the servitization, um, think about the roadmap to get there and combine uh, short-term and long-term opportunities. In the end, the best way to scale something if you're scaling it in a profitable way as well. So make sure that there is a profit on the horizon. Um, and it could also be in terms of uh, increased customer loyalty or um, turning one of revenue into a subscription model with, multiple, with, with recurring revenues. Um, but yeah, there is no one, one circular uh, strategy for a, for a portfolio. Maybe then zooming in, and, and this again is a question that just came in from the audience, is so so the question is, uh, how do you engage stakeholders and who are they? But what I find interesting here is, how do you give them relevant and understandable information to um, get them to change their behavior? So wh where could you focus in a business and feed them with the insights to establish behavioral change? question to me or uh, it's a question I yeah it's a question to you based on on the conversation uh, and and your response just to the question yeah yeah i think most important thing is to get everyone in the organization involved um so the product owners the sales um but also procurement um everyone is in the end contributing to your uh, strategy to your uh, to your products and everyone has their own uh, skills and knowledge uh, to bring. Um, there is, I think, certain, uh, you can take multiple steps. So it's better to take smaller steps and then in the end really change uh, the way your, your, your behavior, etc. But don't try to make a huge leap at one point because then the the chances that you're losing someone is going to be, uh, it's going to be bigger. And always Think about the, the the colleague or your client, which is perhaps uh, as important or even more important. Uh, how are they using your product? What would be additional benefits or what would they need to change and help them through that change story? I think the behavioral change that we require on the long term to enable circularity um, I think everyone kind of has an idea, but what does that mean in practice? And often people think, oh, it's going to be negative because I cannot do X, Y, and Z. Uh, but we need to make sure that the alternative um, is perhaps even better. So instead of doing something uh, um, using, and I think this is a, a very easy example, but uh, using a single-use cup, bringing your own reusable cup, it requires a bit of change. Um, but you need to point out, okay, why it's important and how and help people to make that change. Going from a, a linear model to an as a service model, uh, there are benefits for for uh, for the customer. So also point out those benefits um, in uh, uh, in in your change story. Yeah, I, I very much agree to that. I think this is why strategy is important. If you just focus on reporting, which I think is the the um, the, the the logical thing that people want to focus upon if they see all these requirements coming their way, um, you're just going to collect data from your stakeholders and it's it's going to be a chore for them. It's going to be a chore for you. 
And in the end, okay, you'll take your boxes, but that's it, it's, it's not really making any change. It's just reporting for reporting sake. If you put a strategy to it, and the strategy can be different. It can be just mitigating your risks. It can be look opening up new markets or new products as a real opportunity. And that depends a bit on the business. But if you really look into what is my strategy here and what risks, what opportunities am I mitigating, then it becomes more than a chore. Then you're providing relevant information to your internal stakeholders. They'll change their decisions. They'll train their customers will maybe change their decisions and behaviors as well. If you are able to connect your reporting and your, your metrics et cetera, to a strategy. And I think this is a lot of uh, a big overlook. A lot of people are just focusing, okay, where, where, what data do I need? What numbers do I need to report? And that's it. And maybe summarize the strategy they already have. But if you really connect it to a strategy, it's, it is going to help in behavioral change. Yeah. Thanks, Jaco, for, uh, for that answer. Um, any other reactions from the panelists on, on remarks made? Otherwise, I have a final question on this topic to throw into the mix, but please. Um, yeah, I'm happy to say a bit about stakeholder engagement in that sense. It's a bit more uh, internally focused after after Gibbet here already talked about customers relationships a lot. And personally, I found that um, something that relates to what I said in, in the beginning, that people have an, a narrow understanding of what the circular economy is. And so sometimes they think, oh, this doesn't apply to me, right? But if you start approaching them and you bring up the topic and you give some examples of what that could mean in their, you know, in the scope of their work or their business, their activity, they actually get interested and they start thinking and they come back to me and like, hang on, like, what if we don't buy service anymore? But if we lease service anymore, what would happen? And do we have to think about how the, you know, the leasing provider you know, uh, manages the end of life when we give it back. So, you know, you start a thinking process in, 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 in people once, you know, they have like, um, you know, sort of like something familiar that they can sort of like, you know, talk onto and, and think about in, in their context. And I think just bringing the topic up and giving examples and engaging people really, really helps a lot. And in the end, you know, introduces circularity in many more topics that you hadn't on the, on the agenda at first. Right. I think that's always nice. Start people on one small thing yeah. and then they become enthusiastic and then they take additional steps. I think that's a, so a good way to uh, keep people, uh, get people enthusiastic about circularity and sustainability. No, I like that uh, as well. And and also, Jana, your um, your enthusiasm shines through in uh, in that being your role in the company, which I think is also great, uh, great to see. And a uh, a pivotal element in, in uh, making a real change. Um, with that, I would like to go to the last topic of the, the panel discussion, um, because time flies in, in these type of webinars. And, and that is where we want to focus on how do we set uh, KPIs and, and targets. And uh, Jaco, I would like to address the opening question there to you. Um, because as you know, and actually many times reference, and this, the saying goes, what isn't measured can't be managed. So how with the circular transition indicators, with many of the other abbreviations, the frameworks that we have seen, how does that assist businesses in selecting the right metrics and, and data points for effective reporting? So how can you make that start? Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, yeah, obviously, if you're reporting on circular economy and circular economy strategy, um, how to set your KPIs and targets is is a very crucial step. Um, what we see a lot though is that um, if you look at the, the the latest standards and especially the the CSRD that is 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 now in everybody's mind, and you just go through the disclosure requirements, there's a lot of KPIs and pot potential KPIs and targets in there. Um, that you can focus on, and uh, and even as many as they are, they're still quite high level. They they talk about um, 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 very big concepts like all recyclable materials, all recycled materials, etc. Uh, and I see what I see as a pitfall for many companies is they they just take that list and start noting down. Okay, we can report on that one, can report on that one, that I don't can't don't report on, etc. I think a crucial step here is to be really specific. And the CSRD does allow you to do that. And the CTI and every and the GRI, they do allow you to be very specific and say, okay, well, my biggest risk here or my biggest opportunity here is not all my uh, products going out not being uh, recyclable, but it's really this particular product group because there's an issue here or there's an impact here on sustainability, and that's a big risk or a big opportunity for me. And I'm going to 
report specifically on that one. And uh, then you can go into some of the standards. And I think the CSV is usually a good starting point. But then if you move to the CPI or GRI, they are usually more specific and actually gave you exact formulas. So then you have some work to do to figure out what the exact formula is that you're going to use. But if you make it specific, it does a couple of things. It connects better to strategy. So it's it, it's telling people more of what they need to what they need to know. It's usually easier because you're narrowing the scope. So data collection gets easier. Um, it's also you have to share you share less sensitive data. You really focus on where it hurts or where the opportunity is, and it makes a much nicer narrative. You're saying you really build up your narrative, saying, "Hey, I've got an opportunity here. These are the people that should be working on it internally. These are our targets, and this is why I measured specifically on this target using this standard here." Um, so I think setting KPIs and targets it's it's a tricky but very impactful step if you do it right. Thanks for for laying that uh, that that out. Um, we immediately get questions, and I I heard you, uh, Jaco, uh, mention quite a number of um, acronyms like the the CTI, the Circular Transition Indicator, yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> the the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. So definitely for for people new to this topic, we we know that within the bubble of enthusiasts and people working on this on a daily basis, that can be a bit mind blowing. Uh, but we can definitely also provide kind of overview and guidance if if that is needed. But the question that that just came in um, really asks for a, a a tangible example. Can can you just kind of give an example with an actual metric and an actual business activity and and how this then works? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um... And, and please, well, other panelists as well. Uh, if so, yeah, if I'll give please. one example. Um, so the the, uh, the 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 a lot of these standards ask you to report on what they call circular inflow, and circular inflow would be then either uh, recycled materials that you use or regenerative materials, renewable materials that kind of replenish, uh, like like growing plants and things like that. They, they replenish while you use them uh, and use them responsibly. Um, you can just decide to, um, to to report on all your inflows and whether they're circular or secondary. Um, but then going to all your procurement departments and trying and asking them for all of the materials coming in, do you know whether it's recycled? Do you know whether it's it's renewable? Um, and then you have to explain what that is. Um, that's going to be a very time-consuming effort. And you could wonder, like, what are you going to do with that information? Who's who's really helped with that? What's better is to first ask the question, okay, for which of the inflows would it really uh, make an impact if we go circular? Are there materials that you use in large quantities and hence have a lot of impact or are the materials in there that have, might be a small quantity, but still like are very harmful in some way? Then look up a certificate that is very specific to that flow. So don't just ask, is it, is it renewable? But look for a certificate for instance, if you're looking for paper, move to FSC wood. It's a very example, a very easy example. You have a lot of these certificates out there and start asking, okay, how many of these certificates have we here? And it does a couple of things. Um, first of all, we only have to look for that material, material flow. Second, it's actionable because there's a certificate involved. So procurement can now say, okay, well, actually we don't know yet, or it's only 5%, but right now, you know what? Next year, we're gonna put in some of our tenders. And we're going to ask some suppliers to move more to, for a plan to move to more of the certificates. It's a very actionable part. Um, and it's also much more easy to tell. It's not you just saying, hey, I'm renewable. And then an accountant starting to question like, okay, do you have anything other than an email from your supplier saying that it's indeed renewable or do you have some proof? It makes it much more of a strong narrative. Even if you say, well, it's only 3% now, but we have a target to go to 30%. People understand that. Um, so that's just an easy example. Thanks, Jaco. Any other responses from the other panelists? Perhaps, Jana, you want to reply? Otherwise, I have a different type of metric. <laughs> a different, yeah, um, something like that, that I can maybe add here in a more general level. I think when you um, start on working on your metrics, and it can be something like secondary or, or renewable volumes or percentage that you have, um, something that we struggled with in the beginning when working on the metrics was that we, we really needed to 
um, sort of like take a couple minutes and, and see that everyone starts off in developing them, having the same understandings of terminologies, um, definitions, uh, sort of starting at the, you know, at the same, same level. And for example, what that, what does that mean in a practical sense? Um, you know that um, OMV group um, is uh, using plastic waste as a feedstock to recycle for products. Um, so there is a big, a, a large number of feedstock coming in that is recycled plastic, so secondary material. And then in, in engaging with the CSRD, you also have waste management as a topic there. So what uh, people really struggled with in the beginning is like mixing up waste as a feedstock and then waste as in your operational waste. And they are, you know, they're sort of treated differently. They have different impacts, risks and opportunities. So it really makes sense to be very clear what it is you're talking about and what it is that you try to measure. Thanks, Jana. Uh, Divertje, would your example be, be relevant in addition? Well, uh, so I think linking it um, uh, to material use in general and the, uh, the, the, the material use per product or per euro revenue, I think that's very important within circularity as well. Overall, what we aim to do is decouple material use from uh, well-being and economic activity. And one of those uh, potential ways to measure that is how much materials are you using per sales unit uh, and how much materials it could be virgin materials, recycled materials. Um, so, so both uh, of, of them. Um, and this is important because if we, uh, the, the current um, usage of material that we see in the world is not sustainable. So we need to start looking at, at changing that. And one of the more difficult metrics, and uh, I think it's related or comparable to the intensity metric, perhaps of the greenhouse gas emissions, um, is measuring how much materials, virgin materials, non-renewable materials, are we using per uh, our yeah, unit sales of our main products. Um, so that is, for me, also a very important one, not just looking at the type of inflow, but also how much inflow do you have in general uh, compared to your sales? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting perspective that kind of the, the measurement and the metrics around circularity should not be confined to only the material uh, uh, topics in terms of the, the materials, but, but also to the economic. Um, there's actually a, a question which I thought was a slight tangent, but I'll throw it in the mix anyway, uh, which is um, in the transition from linear to circular economy, we, we need to bring the externalities back in real cost um, to address the affordability gap. So in simple words, if I understand the question right, circular alternatives in many cases might be more expensive at this moment because we aren't paying for um, uh, emissions or, or other elements. Do you see kind of this dynamic or this topic being addressed in the circular economy metrics uh, schemes at all? Is, is there kind of a start of a solution to, to bridge that gap? Um, maybe I could add a couple of things to that. So I feel like from my personal perspective, I don't see this topic addressed as much in the standards that we have discussed. So for example, in the corporate sustainability directive or the new European standards, but what we have seen in the last couple of years is that the circular economy has sort of been, um, you know, a new a component that has been, you know, started to be integrated in a lot of in a lot of laws that help with the economics of um, circularity. So we've seen it in packaging. We've seen it in single use plastics, for example. There is more um, more regulations, especially on EU level, coming up that help with that. I don't know, for example, the eco design. Um, regulation. So I think it is a process and it is definitely a reality that circular products are not, um, I don't know, adopted as well yet for financial reasons as, as you know, companies would hope, but there is, there is a push in changing this and sort of like, you know, changing the, the environment in which businesses investing into circular solutions are operating and I hope it helps. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, uh, that perspective. Uh, a new question came in. Um, and as we're moving to, um, uh, to closing the session, I think it's an interesting one. 
Um, the question is, we've heard many of these different metric schemes um, in the conversation today. Do you think um, that in the future we will have one uh, kind of go-to framework that we can use instead of the, the variety that we've heard today? Well, um, I can I can speak for I think for Jaco and myself. So we just uh, helped actually um, on the first work stream of the Global Circularity Protocol. So we helped the WBCSD and uh, One Planet Network uh, to look at the landscape and seeing at all the different metrics and standards out there. And the aim of the, the, the Global Circularity Protocol for Business is just indeed to harmonize that because there are so many different uh, standards making it difficult for companies to uh, select. Um, uh, so th I don't think at the moment there's a solution because there are these different uh, frameworks out there, but I think the, the GCP is trying to harmonize that. Um, but I think it's important for companies to also very much look at the existing ones uh, where do you need to be compliant to? And then the ESRS E5 on, on circularity, so which is part of the corporate, uh, sorry, and there's a lot of abbreviations here. Uh, we discussed up front, not to, not to say too many, but it's all sometimes difficult within the sustainability space not to use them. But for the uh, Corporate Sustainable Reporting Directive, uh, circularity has a part, and there are these standards that are met there. Um, starting there at least is, is good so you are compliant and then I think the CTI is a very pragmatic one uh, you, you can use and um, it is also expected that uh, more companies will build on that as well. Yeah. And one, one final thing I think is also important that across the value chain companies are using the similar type of metrics or sharing the similar type of information in order to collectively uh, indeed make the value chain more circle. Um, and you, you are dependent for a lot of things. I think someone mentioned in the, um, uh, in the questions, the digital product passport, which is also upcoming for 2027. And here you are fully uh, uh, dependent on information shared in your value chain. So okay. having then that same uh, common language will help. Thanks a lot, uh, Divertio, for that remark. I think also a great way um, wrapping up uh, this, this content discussion. I even heard you mention that um, you have issued this report, a landscape report, which is a bit of a lay of the land of all these metrics. So for the people that are quite new to the topic or those who want to take note, we'll definitely can share that as well. Um, so on this note, I would like to thank um, you uh, as an audience uh, today for your valuable contributions to the discussion uh, on the efficient and the impactful reporting on the circular economy. Uh, we really hope that you found the insights that, you, um, that were shared by the panelists really helpful and inspiring. But as we wrap up, I would also like to remind you that the recording of this session will be shared with you, so you can revisit the discussion at your own convenience. And additionally, you can start today by filling out the questionnaire on csrdtool.com, where you find our corporate sustainability reporting directive tool and additional resources to, port, uh, to support you in your journey. So thank you again to our panelists, uh, Jana, Divertje, and Jaco, and to everyone in the audience. We really appreciate the engagement today, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.